Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here with Christian Ortalda. We are just waiting a little bit. Okay, that sounds great. So, welcome everybody. Um, this is our first VET expertise webinar. I'm here, really happy to be here, mainly with my dear colleague, Christian Ortalda. Hi, Christian, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. So thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Thank you too. So Christian is one of our dermatologists. He's a board certified dermatologist working or collaborating with us at Vet Expertise. I will just talk a little bit about the Christian's CV because it's really long. So I will try to make it short <laughs> to make a really nice presentation. So. Christian graduated in 2001 at the University of Turin. He worked then until 2013 at small animal practice. And then I think his passion with dermatology started in 2009 in an externship. In 2012, he started his residency program under the supervision of Dr. Chiara Noli and Silvia Colombo. And in 2016, he finished his residency program. And in July 2018, he obtained his certification as a diplomate of the ECVD. Right? I said everything right, Christian? Yes, everything, everything. Okay, perfect. So our webinar today will be about uh, malassezia dermatitis and dog and cat. Um, nothing better than Christian here to talk with us about it. So I will go now to Christian and the word is yours, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Filippa. And I thank you and the tech the expertise to, for giving me this big opportunity to talk about uh, one of, of my subject, so malassezia dermatitis. Uh, so let's start. Uh, okay. Oh. Malassezia is a lipophilic, lipid dependent, and non mycelial yeast. And it appears like a small ovoid to cylindrical cells, as you can see here in the picture. And uh, it reproduces itself by a broad based monopolar budding, giving it the aspect of a peanut or of a little footprint. Uh, we actually uh, have identified. 18 species, but probably there are more. And uh, many species, but few phenotypic tests available. So um, sometimes we need to use DNA sequencing for identify uh, our species of malassezia. Skin colonization by malassezia uh, is something like uh, what happens with cocci. So it happens in the first day of life. And it's a transfer from the beach's flora after the removal of the amniotic membrane and the action of leaking and nursing the, the pets. Uh, in dog, uh, we usually see Malassezia pachydermatis, that is a normal inhabitant of canine, healthy skin, and mucosa. And in cat, we can see Malassezia pachydermatis, but also uh, we can isolate Malassezia nana, especially from the ear canal and Malassezia slophia from the clovehold. So this uh, population is a commensal population and uh, it provides a reservoir that may proliferate under the influence of uh, predisposing factors uh, by the host. Malassezia lives uh, on the stratum corneum. So it lives on the corneal side surface as a commensal so in perfect equilibrium with the host. What prevents uh, malassezia excessive proliferation is uh, regular cutaneous desquamation, the fungistatic effect of the epidermal lipids, the innate immune defense via antimicrobial peptides transferring and complement. It can pass from a commensal attitude to an opportunistic behavior in fact, we can have overgrowth and infection when the defenses of the host are compromised and defenses we talk about physical, chemical, and immunological defenses. So how 
uh, what are the weapons of Malassisia to, to act on the host? So Malassisia is able to produce lipases uh, that alter sebum composition uh, with production of free fatty acids. And this results in skin irritation, malodor, and the production of new nutrients. Phospholipase that is produced by many, many Malassisia strains, 93%, and that gives inflammation. We have the enzymogen that is a toxin of the cell wall that is able to activate complement and uh, give inflammation and pruritus. Protease, protease is important because it directly induces pruritus uh, because it acts on the free nerve endings. And then an important characteristic is the ability to form biofilm. Biofilm is a layer, there are multiple layers of adherent yeast that are embedded in a variable quantities of extracellular matrix. And this is particularly important for otitis externa, in which the biofilm can be an enemy very difficult to fight. Alassisia can also act as, as an allergen. In fact, uh, major allergens have been detected in dogs. And what is interesting is that atopic dogs can have high levels of IgE against Malassisia, while normal dogs, even presenting an active infection, don't show these high levels of IgE against the yeast. About predisposing factors. Mm, relating to the animals, uh, gender and age are not correlated with Malassisia dermatitis. But there are important breed predilection. For example, West Island White Terrier, Basset Hound, American Cocker Spaniel, Shih Tzu, English Setter, Dachshund, Boxer, the Poodle, and the Australian Silky Terrier. If nobody has ever seen an Australian Silky Terrier, here's a picture. And basically, it's a Yorkshire Terrier living in Australia <laughs> because it's really <laughs> the same dog, in my, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, there are ob obviously breeds that are prone to form skin folds in which the yeast uh, uh, is able to survive and to, and to give uh, and to proliferate very well due to the increased moisture. And also between cats, we have uh, uh, predisposed breeds uh, that are the Sphinx and the Devon Rex cat. Any primary disease that is able to cause increased moisture, an alteration of the surface lipids, a disruption of the stratum corneum, so altering the barrier function, or an aberrant immune response, both the innate and adaptive, is able to favor the proliferation and the overgrowth of malassisia. Looking at this kind of disease, we can consider, first of all, hypersensitivity disorders, for example, atopic dermatitis. Atopic dogs are typically, typically pre presented with uh, malassisia otitis or malassisia dermatitis in the interdigital uh, skin because we have a microclimate change uh, related to scratching, leaking, and also an increased production of sebum. Then we have an important role of the microenvironment. I was talking before about the increased moisture in the, for example, in the inter interdigital spaces due to leaking, constant leaking by the atopic animals, and the macroenvironment. So warm climates and increased humidity favor the proliferation of the yeast. Also, we have to consider primary and secondary seborrheic condition. Often, uh, some endocrinopathies like uh, hypothyroidism and uh, hyperadrenocorticism leads to a uh, secondary seborrhea that favor the proliferation of the yeast. Also, there are diseases characterized by an aberrant cornification. An aberrant cornification means an altered stratum corneum barrier function. Some examples are zinc responsive dermatosis, the hepatocutaneous syndrome the autosomic congenital ichthyosis in the American Bulldog and nipple 4 is the gene involved. In cat, uh, a malassisia overgrowth, a diffuse malassisia dermatitis is usually associated with serious life-threatening diseases, as we will see. So about clinical signs, in the dog, 
the most important sign is pruritus. Malassezia dermatitis is a really pruritic dermatitis. Uh, the skin is erythematous. It can show yellowish orange scales. The skin can be greasy, malodorant, with hyperpigmentation and lichenification in the chronic lesions. And these lesions are usually localized on the muscle, the pose, especially the ventral neck, abdomen, as I said before, the interdigital spaces, the nail bed, and the skin folds. We can also have a malassezia paronychia, characterized by the erythema and swelling of the claw fold, <coughs> and the typical staining of the claw that appears red brown, as we will see in a minute. Also, very important, a pruritic erythematous otitis externa, characterized by the presence of a brownish discharge. Also, the medial aspect of the pinna can be hyperpigmented and lichenified in the chronic cases. So, here's some example. We can see this diffuse dermatitis, but with particular interest and localization to the ventral neck that looks hyperpigmented and lichenified. Here we have a sharp A with more or less the same condition. Here we don't have hyperpigmentation, but an important erythema. In this picture, we can see a typical lesion that is uh, the presence of this uh, yellowish keratoseboroic uh, uh, scales uh, on an erythema to the skin. On the right, we can see a more chronic lesion with hyperpigmentation and lichenification. This is the typical West Island white area that we see with this disease. An example of a pododermatitis, this is a dog I saw very recently that showed the constant pruritus. We see alopecia, erythema, and all the spaces when we sampled them were full of yeast. It's a dog that is still under a diagnostic trial for food allergy, so an adverse reaction to food or an atopic dermatitis is just under diet. This is a typical coloration of the claw fold that appears red-brown. And this is two moments of a malassiziotitis, so an uh, acute form with erythema and discharge, and a very, very chronic form with serious, uh, is a kind of hyperplastic otitis, but hyperpigmentation and liquidification are present in this poor dog. In cats, clinical signs are slightly different because the pruritus can be uh, minimal to severe. So we can also can have a situation in which pruritus is not that important. We can see erythema with scales and the greasy seborrheic dermatitis with or without paronychia. We talked before about the predisposed breed, you know, sphinx and devil red scats. In this, in these two um, uh, breeds, malassezia overgrowth uh, can be associated with seborrheic skin, erythema, hyperpigmentation, but in these animals, pruritus usually is absent. And then studies found that patients with retroviral infection, for example, feline immunodeficiency virus, show an increased density of malassezia in the air code, but respect to normal cats, but typically not associated to clinical signs. About the associated disease in cats, there are common diseases like any phenotype of allergic skin disease, for example, flea bite hypersensitivity, adverse reaction, feline atopic skin syndrome. And in these animals, we usually can see dermatitis plus otitis externa. Not so common in my experience. Then there are rare diseases like the feline idiopathic facial dermatitis, that is a disease that usually as a breed position for Persian and Himalayan cats, feline acne, in which in these animals with feline acne, malassezia uh, on biopsy was found on skin surface and even within the comedons. Then feline paraneoplastic alopecia, that is a very rare presentation 
in which we have a skin that is thin, inelastic, shiny. So they talk about a glistening alopecia in association with severe life-threatening diseases. So like carcinoma of the liver, the bile duct, the intestine and the pancreas, the neuroendocrine hepatic carcinoma, and the hepatosplenic plasma cell tumor. Another situation in the cat in which we can find a proliferation of malassezia, diffuse, is a thymoma associated exfoliative dermatitis, usually associated with a, a mediastinic uh, neoplasty. So here's an example of, uh, on the left, of a seruminous otitis externa. And on the right, we can see an otitis externa, but if we look carefully on the eyes, we can see that cat, probably if we look at the nose, is probably a Persian. And so the disease uh, must be more serious and probably is a idiopathic facial dermatitis, like this one, in which we can see this symmetrical lesion with erythema and this brown debris around the ears that met all the ears, and often here there is malassezia overgrowth. And usually, not only malassezia overgrowth, but also um, a proliferation of cocci, and uh, it's, uh, this, this infection must be controlled to, to obtain a clinical success in these animals. This is an example of chin acne in this cat. And then, this is what I was talking before, um, the paraneoplastic alopecia associated with carcinoma of the liver, the bile duct, et cetera, in which we have this glistening, shiny skin. The hairs at the periphery can be easily epilated and is a presentation rare, but um, so, so typical that uh, if you see a cat like this, uh, send it uh, directly to the ultrasound department uh, that, so they can help you with the diagnosis. Diagnosis is made by cytology and we can uh, do a microscopic examination of uh, adhesive tape strips, dry scrapes, for example, from the claw fold, or swabs, and this uh, kind of sampling is restricted to the ear canal. Uh, this preparation can be stained with the modified dry gims stain. So I usually use the DF quick. How can we sample? So we take the adhesive tape strips and we pull it on the, on the lesions. Tape strips is usu useful for the, um, for the places not easy to reach. For example, the interdigital skin uh, that cannot be uh, sampled by an apposition of a glad slide, for example. And uh, we can just uh, uh, color the strip with the, um, with the blue, so with the third uh, colorant, and then look at it on the on the our microscope. This is the sampling for the for the ear canal. So we put a, a swab in the ear canal. Uh, and then we gently roll it on the glass slide. I usually use one side for the right ear, one side for the left ear, so we cannot waste the slides. Then coloration, and then what we see usually can be a situation that goes from normal with few yeasts to an important overgrowth with uh, 100 yeasts for uh, oil impression field. So it's, uh, it can be, can be really impressive, the number of these uh, yeast that we can see in affected animals. Therapy uh, typically involves both uh, topical and systemic medication, depending on the situation. So topical treatments are, of course, uh, appropriate because we are talking of a yeast that lives in the stratum corneum. So we can act directly on it with topical therapy. If we have a poor compliance of the owner or topical therapy looks ineffective, we can shift to systemic therapy. For otitis externa, there, uh, there's the possibility to use topical azoles like clotrimazole, myconazole, posaconazole, 
or terbinafin that can be applied weekly or monthly, depending on the product. Consensus guidelines for the treatment of malsicial dermatitis are clear and show a strong evidence for the use of a 2% myconazole and 2% chlorhexidine shampoo applied twice weekly, four weeks. What is really important is uh, the 10 minutes contact time. So that allows the shampoo and the ingredients to work and to kill the yeast. There is moderate evidence for a 3% chlorhexidine shampoo. And my personal tip is if you can have, if you, if you have them in your country, add medicated wipes on the skin folds. We have uh, wipes containing climbazole that are very, very useful daily when they are not bathed. So they do two baths in the, in the week and the other days you can use the, the medicated wipes. About systemic therapy, uh, I put them in, the, in my favorite order but actually I just using itraconazole, five milligram per kilo per os once daily, or in a pulse kind of pulse therapy, two consecutive days per week. So if you have a severe pododermatitis and it's impossible to, to wash the dog for any reason, you can give itraconazole five milligram per kilo on the weekend for uh, four weeks. So Saturday and Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, Saturday and, Sunday and then you, easily uh, manage the proliferation of the yeast. And itraconazole also is the first choice for cats and can be given five milligram per kilo once daily or on a seven day on or seven days off protocol. Then we have also ketoconazole, but ketoconazole show more side effects. So itraconazole is actually better. Side effects are vomiting, anorexia, lethargy, diarrhea. Fluconazole or terbinafin. Terbinafin at 30 milligram per kilo per os once daily, but the stratum corneum concentration of terbinafin are questionable. Important, systemic therapy is not able to help you for otitis externa. So for otitis, you have to use topical therapy inside the ear. Prevention is important. If we have uh, breeds prone to develop uh, a malsicial dermatitis, for example, a basset hound, we can try to manage uh, with topical therapy twice weekly, for example. Another suggested idea was all right, traconazole, five milligram per kilo once daily, two days on, five days off. But uh, as we will see in the next slide, there is the potential to obtain an antifungal resistance. For otitis externa, it's important to control inflammation because inflammation leads to the yeast proliferation. And inflammation can be controlled with the use of a topical hydrocortisone aciponate two consecutive days per week in a proactive approach. And obviously, if you find an underlying disease, food allergy, atopic dermatitis, or what else, you have to control it, identify and control it. Um, what is important about uh, zoonotic aspects is that uh, there is uh, an azole tolerance that is reported in isolates of Malassicia pachydermatis worldwide. And uh, Keno and Tanagata uh, show that uh, myconazole exposure in vitro leads to an amino acid substitution in ERG11, ERG sorry, that is the gene responsible to create tolerance to several azoles. Then, zoonotic important aspect, Malassicia pachydermatis can cause a life-threatening fungemia in human neonates that are within the intensive care units, receiving parenteral nutrition through central venous catheters. And uh, in a recent article, another important alternative therapy, but always in vitro, uh, Corona and Vercelli uh, showed that a 20% lactoferricin solution, and lactoferricin is an antimicrobial peptide, is effective to kill Malassicia pachydermatis strains isolated in vitro. So with this slide, uh, I end my presentation. I thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much. So... Let's see, I'm back. Thank you, Christian, very much. 
Let's try to stop the share screening maybe. Can you, okay, here. Okay, perfect. So I noticed that our chat is not, it's not on on the YouTube. So what I would like to ask was listening to us. If you have any questions regarding the malassezia dermatitis, just please send us by email that is in the presentation or in our social media, always with expertise. And we will very please, we'll be very pleased to answer you the questions. If you want Christian's or Tal, their opinion in some other case you may have, this is what Vet Expertise is doing. We do a specialized teleconsulting service. What this means is you can go to our website, just send us a clinical case, and you will get for sure Christian or Tal to answer the dermatology cases for you. Yes. So I thank you, Christian, very much for being here with us. And hopefully we will see you again soon. And I thank you everybody for watching the webinar. It will be on our YouTube, so you can always access to it again. And any questions, just let us know. Okay. Thank you everybody for everything. Everybody. Have a lovely evening.